Okay, so my, my talk today is about the advantages of this time trigger decan that we have heard in the morning already, uh, which is used on Orion. Uh, and I want to start off my presentation uh, with something which has not been addressed before uh, in, the, in that conference uh, and which I find very interesting. So this is a slide from NASA JPL which has been used uh, in, in spring or uh, I think it was in June uh, on the harness reduction workshop uh, at JPL. Uh, and it has been done by Jim Donaldson, uh, so he's a very experienced avionic guy. Um, and what they see, and this is, uh, I think, very interesting for the whole space industry, is uh, when we look here at, they call it dilemma of uh, electronics or of avionics uh, in space. So what we see here is the consumer electronics, uh, the automotive electronics, uh, the aviation electronics, and here is the space electronics. Uh, so what we see is, is, is in the past years, uh, the, a lot of, of uh, silicon manufacturers or silicon uh, fabs uh, shut it down their radiation business. Uh, a lot of, of processes are disappearing and this is what, sh what should be shown in that presentation and this is also a little bit of what we are thinking about. Uh, so technologies can only survive if they are uh, cross industry, so if they are used out of space, uh, if they are pushed uh, by the big community. Uh, and if they can deal with uh, obsolescence. Uh, I also want, I, I do not want to, to take now all the present, uh, all the slides from that workshop. Uh, I also want to show you um, another thing which has been done by JPL. Uh, so this is also from this, uh, from this workshop and this is a trade which has been done in 2013, sorry. Uh, and it has been done for the Europa mission. Uh, so the, the, there was a trade on communication networks uh, for the Europa mission and they looked into different communication networks uh, and this were a little bit their, their requirements they found uh, and they said all the communication protocols uh, which are not able to fulfill these requirements we are not uh, looking into that uh, more detail uh, and what we see here is uh, again uh, so it's based on COTS uh, test equipment uh, it must be serial uh, redundancy must be built in into the protocol uh, it must uh, have uh, users outside of JPL or outside of space. It must have uh, technical legs, so it must it must be developed further by a bigger community. Uh, it must be DC isolated, self-clocking, bigger than 100 megabit because they said uh, the, the MIL 1553 already has one megabit, so we want to have it 100 times faster at least. Uh, 20 meters of communication. Um, and must support separation because a lot of missions are dealing with separation and it must be uh, time, it must be have a time distribution support uh, built in into the protocol. Uh, so let's go on. I now want to look a little bit more into, into architectures. So how do reliable or high, high reliable architectures look like? Um, so as we have heard in the morning, there are two possible ways uh, to have uh, correct data in your system. So one is you do voting. So you send it out multiple uh, times and you do voting between it. Uh, the other one is uh, you ensure that the received data, that the value of the received data is correct. Uh, that sounds very easy. Uh, let's see how, how we will do that. Uh, and then the other topic which has to be correct uh, is the temporal order of the uh, data you receive. I will go into that a little bit more detail. Uh, what we need here is a synchronization. So this means uh, there, are, there are two possibilities to do this fault tolerant architectures, which is the voting architecture, voting or Byzantine voting. We've already heard this also during the uh, different talks. Uh, and then we have uh, fail silence, uh, which we call also common uh, or dual core lockstep or self-checking pair. So there are different uh, names for that. And I want to show you that on a, on a simple example, what I mean with the temporal order. Uh, so let's assume we have, uh, we have a separation system of, of a launcher. Uh, we have here uh, the altitude uh, and here we have the real time. Uh, and uh, when we got higher in the altitude, uh, we see uh, the, the different channels. Uh, and let's assume we have now here two channels uh, and the two channels, uh, they provide a correct data. So they say, uh, separation and fire the boosters, channel one, and no separation and do not fire the boosters, channel two. So the, the data is right or is correct, uh, but uh, temporarily it has been, uh, the data has been taken at two different temporal uh, times or two different times 
uh, and uh, let's assume we have now a third channel and the third channel says uh, because it's faulty it says no separation and fire the boosters yeah and now we do a maturity voting of that uh, and the maturity voting says uh, no separation and fire the boosters so what we need is we need to have a temporal order uh, within uh, uh, a spare t a sparse time uh, so we need to guarantee the temporal order of, of the data so let's now look into a commercial or conventional or currently used architecture with MIL-1553. So let's assume we have here three computers. Uh, the computers have a, a bus controller uh, and the bus terminals, and each of the, of the computers is connected via one bus terminal to the others so that all, all of them get the same state. Uh, so we transmit the data in, in all of these uh, networks or in all of these channels, uh, and all the computers have the same state. Um, so we have here three redundant lanes, uh, one fault tolerant. We cannot cover Byzantine faults or uh, tricky faults here, uh, but, but it, it's a voting system, two out of three. Uh, but what is the problem behind that? Uh, so if we want to now vote between the data, so if we want to do two out of three, uh, we need to have uh, a global synchronized time base to which we can vote. So we have here now the same states. Uh, we are partly synchronized by the 1553. Uh, but we need a more uh, precise uh, synchronization, uh, where we need, uh, which we need as basis for the voting. Uh, so, yeah, and the voting is done in two out of three. So if we lose one component uh, in one network, we lose the whole lane. So we lose the whole 1553 lane. Good. What are the disadvantages of this of, of such an architecture? Yeah? Uh, so we need. Uh, an additional point-to-point -point or a communication network that ensures low latency synchronization. Yeah. Uh, we need to use, uh, we will have then multiple protocols. So we need one for the synchronization, uh, we will need one for the deterministic data, and then typically we need an additional one for high-speed data. Uh, so what, to what does it, does it lead? It, to, it leads to a lot of different communication networks, uh, it needs to a lot of cabling, uh, it, uh, we need uh, to run a software and the software is, is taking care of the precise synchronization of the redundancy management uh, of the support of the different protocols uh, so this this means we need a lot of testing because we have a lot of different protocols we have a lot of different software uh, and and so on so good uh, let's now go to the time triggered communication and see if, if we can solve the problem uh, what do we need for a time triggered communication uh, first of all, we, we need a global notion of time. So we need a synchronization uh, in the network. So we have here different nodes. They see different times. Uh, and what we would like to do is we would like to synchronize them uh, to a global notion of time. If we can achieve that, uh, we can work on the basis of this global notion of time uh, and can then run uh, a schedule. So we schedule our mes messages onto the network based on this global time information. But what is the problem with that synchronization? So if we start up uh, different components, uh, then the, the problem would be one is coming up earlier, the other is coming up later. And if the bigger the network gets, uh, the more problems we get uh, because we need to uh, have uh, or we need to get one global time base. Yeah? Uh, but what we can get here is we can get here uh, problems like uh, clicks. So this means an area of the network synchronizes but another area of the network synchronizes to another time. Uh, and this, uh, so there needs to be a support for uh, checking if, the, if this cl these clicks uh, are there, so detection uh, and uh, how, this, how these clicks are solved. Uh, also during startup, you have to find a, a mechanism how they start up in a synchronous way. Uh, so what, what is implemented in this time triggered Ethernet is a startup service that ensures that all the nodes start up uh, and synchronize uh, within a defined uh, way and, th and this has been formally proven. Uh, what is then done is, so the different clocks has different drifts, uh, so there are slow clocks and faster clocks, uh, and after an interval of a resynchronization interval, uh, they agree, they exchange messages and they synchronize back again, uh, then the drift starts again and after this resynchronization interval they synchronize again. So that's how uh, the synchronization is kept into a bounded uh, 
precision and we exactly know this precision uh, according to the network setup. Good, uh, so how does this work now? Uh, so if you have a network, uh, so here we have a, a two channel network, so we have two lanes. Uh, we can also synchronize it to external components like MIL 15, uh, uh, like 1588, uh, IEEE 1588. Uh, but it, we have here, here now two channels and what is happening now or what I can decide is who is participating in my synchronization. So I select, uh, let's say my best clocks or my most critical clocks uh, and I say, okay, these are, are participating in the synchronization. Uh, if I've selected them, uh, then they will be configured and they will start to send messages into the network. Uh, there will be an agreement, a fault tolerant average agreement. Uh, and afterwards we have established a clock or a global time base in the whole network. So now all the nodes in the network uh, will be synchronized uh, and uh, the advantage of the synchronization is it's fault tolerant. So I can have now here different faults in the system and I can tolerate uh, these faults in the system. So I get uh, a reliable fault tolerant clock and I can work on it. So I have no single master clock and if the master clock dies I have to switch over to another clock. Uh, so here I have really one clock in the whole network and each node uh, in the network uh, that is communicating over this time this time triggered uh, traffic or which gets this synchronization frames exactly knows the time uh, uh, in the network. Uh, but we before we have seen that the sending order is a big problem and exactly uh, this sending order uh, has to be taken into account because otherwise we have different states uh, and the temporal behavior is not right. And I will show you how that works on a very simple example. Uh, so we have here uh, a node A uh, sending a frame at 10, uh, so the frame F1, and then we have the node B sending a frame at 10.05. Uh, so the node, uh, so the message from node B arrives at 10.10 because it, the node B is, let's say, nearer to C, uh, and the message from A arrives at 10.20 because it, uh, the, the path is, is, is further away. Uh, so what we see here is a sends before B, but the message from A is received after the message from B. So we have a switch in the sending order uh, and this will cause us problems because the state here and the state here could have changed uh, in, in the system. Uh, so how, how can that be handled? Uh, so we are now looking for uh, a maximum transmission delay. So according to the network setup, uh, we know that the longest path in the network could be 30. Uh, and we take this value now and say uh, this 30 minus the transparent clock. The transparent clock is the time the message takes from A to C, so the 20, and from B to C, the 10. Yeah. Uh, and now we are doing a simple calculation. So we say uh, this permanence delay, the permanence point in time. So when the message gets permanent is the maximum transmission delay minus this transparent clock delay plus the arrival point in time. And we're getting to 1035. And we're doing the same for the, for the frame uh, from A. So we say 1020 when it has arrived plus this maximum transmission delay, so our maximum path minus the 20, so the time it took on the line. And we're getting to 1030. So what we, are do, what, what we see here is uh, the, the sending order has been re-established so now the frame from A arrives at 10.30 and the frame from B arrives at 10.35. So we have back the five minutes uh, of the sending of the sender. Uh, so when the, when the message was sent. Uh, and this is done for the synchronization, to establish the synchronization. As soon as the synchronization is established, all your message that you send over the network are in the correct order because everybody knows the time uh, at his local place. How does it look now when we want to synchronize that to external sources? Uh, so it's possible to synchronize this, uh, ec this network time to an external GPS time. Uh, this can be done in a fault tolerant manner. So this means uh, you, you synchronize this network time, so the absolute time, to the uh, fault tolerant uh, network time. Good, uh, let's go on now. So now we have established uh, the fault tolerant uh, synchronized time. Uh, and now 
Uh, I've shown that also on Monday this slide because I think it illustrates quite well how, how it works. Um, now we, 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 we are looking into the, the traffic which we want to transmit. Uh, and we see here, so the clocks should illustrate that these components are synchronized. Uh, this component is not synchronized. And now we want to transmit the message. So we transmit the message M at 10.45. Uh, we know it arrives between 10.40 and 10.50 at the receiving port. If it arrives outside of this window, we, we would drop it because then, it, then something was faulty. Uh, and this is how we can uh, handle, for example, bubbling idiot faults uh, in an end system or by sometimes faults here uh, because we check exactly the window in which the message arrives. Uh, the switches are doing store and forward. So uh, you, it is possible here to delay by a defined amount of time the frame because it's the next scheduling point when the frame is sent. And in the switch, uh, the, ho the whole Ethernet checks uh, as well as these timing checks are done. So a faulty frame or a faulty message from here would not go or it would not pass the switch. Uh, then it's forwarded. The next switch is doing the same, uh, checking this acceptance window and forwarding it uh, to the receivers. Uh, and what we see here now is uh, this is done, uh, let's say, offline. Uh, so the schedule which is created is done by a tool. And after the tool run, I exactly know the latencies in my system. So I exactly know the latency from the sender to the receiver. And I exactly know the cheater of my system, which is depending on the clock synchronization precision. Uh, I can connect with a standard laptop or standard Ethernet equipment to the same network. Uh, and I would receive my frame, but I'm not aware of the global time. Um, so the, the, the protocol itself does not only support this time-triggered traffic class. Yeah? So this time-triggered traffic is one part of three. So there's, there's this time-triggered traffic, the rate-constraint traffic, and the standard Ethernet traffic. Uh, and how does it work on the line? Uh, so here you see the periodic uh, time-triggered packages. So you can, you can define different periods. Uh, so major frames, minor frames, you can, you can select uh, multiple of these periods. And in these periods, you could place your time-triggered frames. Uh, and they are fixed. So the position of them is fixed in time based on the synchronization. And in between, uh, there can be rate-constraint traffic, uh, which is, is limited to an upper bound of, of bandwidth, uh, and standard Ethernet traffic, which is standard Ethernet traffic as you know it. So this allows you to combine different critical traffic on the same network, on the same physical media, uh, just by a temporal abstraction, a temporal partitioning. How is it implemented? Uh, this functionality, so the startup, recovery, this robust fault tolerant clock uh, is implemented on layer two. Uh, so <coughs> you can have all the upper layers according to standard Ethernet. So this means it would look on IP or UDP layer, it, it looks the same as well as on Mac layer as a standard Ethernet frame. Um, how does it look like with fault containment? Uh, so today we have already heard about fault containment regions. So how is that, is, does that work out here? Uh, so to build up uh, single or dual fault tolerant systems, so here it shows a single fault tolerant system or there can be a single fault tolerant system. Uh, and you assume now here uh, we have a fault in this end system. This fault would never propagate over the switch. This is what we have heard before. So the switch would temporarily, uh, let's say, firewall uh, the whole network from a faulty end system. Uh, and uh, how does it look in the switches? Uh, and we say that uh, it's possible to uh, have single fault tolerant systems if we have high integrity uh, in the switches. So here we say strictly omissive asymmetric faults with high integrity in the switches or transmissive asymmetric faults in the in the uh, in the end systems if they don't have this high integrity. But what, the, what does this high integrity mean? Uh, this high integrity means uh, we're working here with self-checking pair or COM1 uh, architecture. So this means we have an input. Uh, the input is used by a commander and a monitor. Uh, and then there is a comparator. The comparator gets the data from the commander and from the monitor, compares it, and if they are equal, uh, the, the output is open. If they do not agree, uh, then the, uh, the output would be strictly omissive, which means uh, it would be fail silent. So this means 
uh, if there is a fault, the fault will not propagate up out of this unit uh, because it, it will, so nothing will be sended. Uh, if there is no fault, then uh, it will operate uh, accordingly. Good. Uh, if we go on now, uh, this is another slide uh, for what the protocol uh, is, has been used. Uh, so this is a slide from, from, from NASA some time ago. Uh, and the idea here is uh, to do systems of systems or system fusion. And the, the, this slide shows here uh, the Orion at that times uh, plus the lander. Uh, and the goal was uh, that Orion uh, has the control over the lander. So how, how can we control that? Uh, so we put them together. Both of them have a separate network. Uh, and these separate networks are now put it together into one network. Uh, and I have now here a synchronization priority one uh, and the synchronization priority two. So I combine these two together, they synchronize to the same global time base. Uh, and then with that, it allows me to control from the higher priority network, the lower priority network. So I can, ca can run control loops from, for example, the Orion capsule over the lander. So I can control the lander from Orion. And this was one of the biggest part and, and uh, a very interesting part, which, which was built into the protocol for, for this kind of use. And it allows you now to do different mission scenarios. Yeah? You send up multiple SLSs, uh, you put them together to a vehicle, you fly the vehicle, uh, you do some operation uh, and so on, and then you go back down on, on Earth. Um, I want to show you also how, how we built it in into, into uh, an ASIC which, on which we are currently working. Uh, so this is the ASIC here. Uh, you've heard from this COM1. So here we have the switch uh, monitor, the switch commander. Uh, they are based on the same silicon. Uh, they have separate power supplies. They have clock monitoring uh, to avoid common mode failures. Uh, and uh, the, the agreement is, is done here. It's, it's not shown explicitly. Uh, but uh, the, the goal here is uh, to really handle that uh, within on the same silicon to reduce the power consumption and to be very efficient. Um, so this is the, the, the ASIC on which we're currently working. It will become available in Q3 2016. Um, and uh, it includes the switch COM1. Uh, it includes an end system with a hardware IP UDP stack. Uh, we have heard today about the Airing 653. So it has in, hard, in hardware Airing 653 partitions also, so a hardware partitioning support, uh, which allows you to, to access that via different application tasks completely separately. Uh, and it has a management CPU, uh, which runs SNMP uh, or TFTP for data loading onto the whole device. And it has a, a bunch of different interfaces to the CPU uh, and, and other interfaces. Uh, just to show you, this is a little bit of the, of the, of the product uh, environment we are offering here. So different uh, development, hardware, uh, production chips, uh, different development systems. So we have developed a whole, uh, a whole driver according to DO178C uh, uh, for, uh, for flight in, in, in FAA projects or in, 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 in commercial planes, uh, which are using exactly this technology. And what I wanted to show you with that, uh, also with the next slide, I want to show you that, so I want to refer to the slide from our NASA JPL. Um, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to use the same core technology uh, and we are trying to bring that into different applications. So the same uh, core is here used in uh, a Sikorsky radar uh, flight demonstrator helicopter, which, uh, which, will, be, which, which will be progressed uh, in the Orion uh, in a wind turbine from Vestas in the Audi A8 piloted driving. Uh, in, it goes into service in 2018. Uh, in the Ariane 6 rocket uh, and on an old plateau. Yeah. And, and this is, is the goal really to develop one core technology and then spread it out into different products uh, and to leverage uh, the advantages of, of that. So uh, to come to a conclusion, uh, the protocol and the implementation uh, supports uh, the synchronization, uh, the deterministic communication, fault tolerance, uh, but it also allows you the flexibility of standard Ethernet. Uh, and this leads to a, a reduction in software complexity, 
uh, which we have seen over the past uh, projects on which we are working. Uh, and uh, we are currently working on the space created components. We also work on, an, on a radiation hardened Ethernet Pi, uh, for example. And uh, the, the technology provides you a lot of cross industry developed uh, tools, uh, embedded software, uh, test equipment, and so on. Thank you very much. Okay, we have questions. Yes. So when you're showing um, Orion and the lander coming together, you have priority one, priority two. Now, how do those synchronize? Is it like a hard jump in time for priority two, or does it slew it, or how do they <laughs> how do they get synced up? Oh, it's 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 really so. So what the network sees is it sees uh, let's say uh, time frames with a higher priority, and it takes over the time of the higher priority. So it's really a let's say a a very sharp. Uh, jump in time. Yeah. So, so as a software guy, how does that? <laughs> 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 That's right. So you have to you have to have some mechanisms in software that that are able to tolerate that. Yeah. <coughs> Other questions? Uh, you mentioned that you were working on a radiation hardened Ethernet Pi. When will that be available? Um, so, so we th so there are two different projects currently running. So one is, or let's say, two projects plus an additional commercial component will, will which will come up. Uh, so one is uh, a radiation characterization of COTS Pi. Uh, so there is an Ether project running where four uh, Ethernet uh, COTS Pi's have been uh, have been selected. Uh, and they are currently running through a, a radiation characterization uh, and there will be the first results Q1 next year. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and currently there is a plan for how this will be commercialized, so packaged into ceramic chips and so on. Uh, but it was not so easy to find uh, providers where you can, uh, let's say, purchase a lot and you get all the devices from the same lot, uh, from a COTS uh, file. Uh, there were some uh, another topic where we're working on is a, is a, a 10 100 Ethernet Pi. Uh, so this is currently fully funded with around 3.4 uh, million uh, US dollar. Uh, and the first samples will be available uh, in 2017, Q1 2017. Uh, but we are currently looking how if we could speed up that. Uh, and uh, then there is also TI is currently working on a, on a Pi uh, or radiation characterization of a Pi. Uh, that should come out next year or beginning of 2017, according to, to my knowledge. And, and also Aeroflex has worked on a, on a FI, uh, but they have stopped the, the development because there was, a, um, uh, there was some kind of a, of a, metal, um, a metal junction uh, on, the, on, the, on the silicon, uh, which was not usable for deep space application, and then they have stopped it. But they got very good radiation uh, numbers. Very good. Other questions? Yes. You were talking about uh, built-in redundancy. What type of uh, redundancy is built within this uh, network? Um, so, so the the the, the built-in redundancy. So, so what is done is, uh, so for example, Orion is using dual fault tolerance. So you can scale the network from, uh, let's say. Uh, standard switched architecture up to dual fault tolerant architecture, which has then three planes or three channels, uh, which you may have seen in the morning in, in, in on, on the architecture of Orion. Uh, and, and, and the protocol is, is capable of, by configuration, by the implementation, to scale from single to up to dual fault tolerant. Okay, very good. Thank, Thank you. you.